Chapter 13 is called Good Progress. Far into the night, while the other creatures slept, Charlotte worked on her web. First, she ripped out a few of the orb lines near the center. She left the radial lines alone, as they were needed for support. As she worked, her eight legs were great help to her. She, so were her teeth. She loved to weave, and she was an expert at it. When she was finished ripping things out, her web looked something like this. And there's actually pictures in here. I haven't been showing them to you, but that's kind of what her web looked like. A spider can produce several kinds of thread. She uses a dry, tough thread of foundation lines, and she uses sticky thread for snare lines, the ones that catch and hold insects. Charlotte decided to use her dry thread for writing new messages. If I write the word terrific with sticky thread, she thought, every bug that comes along will get stuck in it and spoil the effect. Now, let's see, the first letter is a T. Charlotte climbed up to the top of the left-hand side of her web. Swinging her spinners into position, she attached the thread and then dropped down. As she dropped, her spinning tubes went into action and she let out the thread. At the bottom, she attached the thread. This formed the upright part of the letter T. Can you picture that? Charlotte was not satisfied, however. She climbed up and made another attachment, right next to the first. Then she carried the line down so that it had a double line instead of a single line. It will show up better if I make the whole thing with double lines. She climbed back up, moved over about an inch to the left, touched her spinners to the web, and then carried a line across to the right, forming the top of the T. She repeated this, making it double. Her eight legs were very busy helping. Now for the E. Charlotte got so interested in her work that she began to talk to herself, as though to cheer herself on. If you had been sitting quietly in the barn cellar that evening, you would have heard something like this. Now for the R. Up we go, attach, descend. Pay outline, whoa, attach, good. Up you go, repeat, attach, descend. Pay outline, whoa girl, steady now, attach. Climb, attach, over to the right, pay outline, attach. Now, right down and swing that loop around and around. Pay outline, whoa, attach, ascend, repeat, good girl. And so, talking to herself, the spider worked at her difficult task. When it was completed, she felt hungry. She ate a small bug that she had been saving and then she slept. The next morning when Wilbur arose, stood beneath the web, he breathed the morning air into his lungs. Drops of dew catching the sun made the web stand out clearly. When Lurvy arrived with his breakfast, there was the handsome pig over him. Woven neatly in block letters was the word, terrific. Another miracle. Lurvy rushed and called Mr. Zuckerman, and Mr. Zuckerman rushed and called Mrs. Zuckerman, and Mrs. Zuckerman ran to the phone and called the Arables. The Arables climbed into their truck and hurried over. Okay, I'll show you the picture there. Terrific. Everybody stood at the pig pen and stared at the web and read the word over and over, while Wilbur, who really felt terrific, stood quietly swelling out his chests and swinging his snout from side to side. Terrific, breathed Zuckerman in joyful admiration. Edith, you better phone the reporter on the Weekly Chronicle and tell him what happened. He will want to know about this. He may want to bring a photographer. There isn't a pig in the whole state that is as terrific as our pig. The news spread. People who had journeyed to see Wilbur when he was some pig came back to now see that he was terrific. That afternoon when Mr. Zuckerman went to milk the cows and clean out the tie-ups, he was still thinking about what a wondrous pig he owned. Lurvy, he called, there is to be no more cow manure thrown in down in this pig pen. I have a terrific pig. I want that pig to have clean, bright straw every day for his bedding. Understand? Yes, sir, said Lurvy. Furthermore, said Mr. Zuckerman, I want you to start building a crate for Wilbur. I have decided to take the pig to the county fair on September 6th. Make the crate large and paint it green with gold letters. What will the letters say? asked Lurvy. They should say Zuckerman's famous pig. Lurvy picked up the pitchfork and walked away to get some clean straw. Having such an important pig was going to mean plenty of extra work. He could see that. Below the apple orchard at the end of the path was the dump, where Mr. Zuckerman threw all sorts of trash and stuff that no one wanted anymore. 
Here, in a small clearing hidden by the young alders and the wild raspberry bushes, was an astonishing pile of old bottles and empty tin cans, dirty rags, and bits of metal. Templeton knew the dump and he liked it. There was a good hiding place there, excellent cover for a rat. And there was usually a tin can with food still clinging to the inside. Templeton went down there now rummaging around and when he returned to the barn, he carried in his mouth an advertisement that he had torn from a crumpled magazine. How's this? He asked, showing the ad to Charlotte. It says crunchy. Crunchy would be a great word to write in your web. <laughs> Just the wrong idea, replied Charlotte. Couldn't be worse. We don't want Zuckermans to think about Wilbur as crunchy. He might start to think about crisp, crunchy, bacon, or tasty ham. That would put ideas into his head. No, no, no. We must advertise Wilbur's noble qualities, not his tastiness. Get another word, please, Templeton. The rat looked disgusted, but he snuck away to the dump and was back with a strip of cotton cloth. How's this? It's from a label from an old shirt. Charlotte examined the label. It said, pre-shrunk. I'm sorry, Templeton, she said, but pre-shrunk is out of the question. We want Zuckerman to think Wilbur has filled out nicely, not all shrunk up. I'll have to ask you to try again. What do you think I am, a messenger boy? Grumbled the rat. I'm not gonna spend all my time chasing down the dump for advertising material. Just one more, please, said Charlotte. I'll tell you what I'll do, said Templeton. I know where there's a package of soap flakes in the woodshed. It has writing on it. I'll bring you back a piece of the package. He climbed the rope that hung on the wall and disappeared through the hole in the ceiling. When he came back, he had a strip of blue and white cardboard in his teeth. There, he said triumphantly, how's that? Charlotte read the words. With new radiant action. What does that mean? Asked Charlotte, who had never used soap flake in her life. How should I know, said Templeton. You asked for the words and I brought them. I suppose next thing you're gonna want is for me to fetch a dictionary. Together they studied the soap ad. With new radiant action, replied Charlotte slowly. Wilbur, she called. Wilbur, who was asleep in the straw, jumped up. Run around, commanded Charlotte. I wanna see you in action. I wanna see if you are radiant. Wilbur raced to the end of the yard. Now back again, faster, said Charlotte. Wilbur galloped back and his skin shone. His tail had fine, tight curl in it. Jump in the air, cried Charlotte. Wilbur jumped as high as he could. Keep your knees straight and touch the ground with your ears, called Charlotte. Wilbur obeyed. Do a backflip with half a twist in it, cried Charlotte. Wilbur went over backwards, writhing and twisting as he went. Okay, Wilbur, said Charlotte, you can go back to sleep. Okay, Templeton, the soap ad will do, I guess. I'm not sure Wilbur's actions are exactly radiant, but it is interesting. Actually, said Wilbur, I feel radiant. Do you, said Charlotte, looking at him with affection. Well, you are a good little pig. With radiant, you shall be. I'm in this thing pretty deep now. I might as well go to the limit. Tired from his romp, Wilbur lay down in the clean straw and he closed his eyes. The straw seemed scratchy, not as comfortable as a cow manure, which was always delightful to lie in. So he pushed the straw to one side and stretched out in the manure. Wilbur sighed. It had been a busy day, his first day of being terrific. Now he was tired. Fern had arrived and seated herself quietly on her stool in the corner. Tell me a story, Charlotte, said Wilbur, as he lay waiting for sleep to come. Tell me a story. So Charlotte, although she too was tired, did what Wilbur wanted. Once upon a time, she began, I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. One day, a tiny fish leapt into the air and got tangled in the web. My cousin was very much surprised, of course. The fish was thrashing wildly. My cousin hardly dared tackle it, but she did. She swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material around the fish and bravely fought to capture it. Did she succeed, asked Wilbur. It was a never to be forgotten battle, said Charlotte. There was the fish caught only by one fin and its tail wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. There was the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish. How much did the fish weigh, asked Wilbur eagerly. I don't know, said Charlotte. There was my cousin slipping in and dodging out, beating mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing her threads and fighting hard. First she threw the left around the tail. 
She threw a left around the tail and the fish lashed back. Then a left to the tail and a right to the midsection, the fish lashed back. Then she dodged to one side and threw a right and another right in the fin. Then a hard left to the head and the web swayed and stretched. Then what happened, asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. The fish lost the fight. My cousin wrapped it so tight that it couldn't budge. Then what happened, asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. My cousin kept the fish for a while, and then when she got good and ready, she ate it. Tell me another story, begged Wilbur. So Charlotte told him about another cousin of hers who was an aeronaut. What is an aeronaut, asked Wilbur. A balloonist, said Charlotte. My cousin used to stand on her head and let the thread form a balloon, and then she would let go and be lifted into the air and carried upward on the warm wind. Is that true, asked Wilbur, or are you just making it up? It's true, replied Charlotte. I have some very remarkable cousins. And now, Wilbur, it's time that you went to sleep. Sing me something, begged Wilbur, closing his eyes. So Charlotte sang a lullaby while crickets chirped in the grass and the barn grew dark. This was the song she sang. Sleep, sleep, my love, my only, deep, deep in the dung and the dark. Be not afraid and be not lonely. This is the hour when frogs and thrushes praise the world from the wood and the rushes. Rest from care, my one and only, deep in the dung and the dark. But Wilbur was already asleep. When the song ended, Fern got up and went home.